Hi, this is Chaplain Greg. Welcome back to the Wandering Wesleyan and our Walking in the Word series. We are on the end of the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament, and we're going to be finishing up with the Minor Prophets. Now, the Minor Prophets are not minor because they're less important. They're only minor because they're smaller. They're smaller books than the Major Prophets, which tend to be larger books, uh, you know, reading Amos and reading um, Ezekiel are two different endeavors. One you can do in less than a half an hour. The other you can do probably within two or three hours. So um, the minor prophets are very important. Um, they're quoted widely throughout the New Testament. They're referred to throughout the New Testament. So it's, it's important that we pay attention to them. So um, remember that each book packs a big punch big punch in a smaller packet and uh, like the major prophets when the minor prophet books were written is very very important so we divide up the minor prophets uh, in our bibles they're not divided up this way but this is a good way to think of them so those books that were written before the exile are jose and this was written to both the north and the south and probably uh, to Jeroboam the second. Um, Amos, written to both the north and the south, also to Jeroboam the second. Micah, this is after the north, the, the country we call Israel, was uh, taken by the Assyrians, um, but before the Judah exile by the Babylonians. So Micah was right after the northern exile. Habakkuk was also right after the northern exile. And Zephaniah was during the King Josiah's time. So Jose, Amos, Jonah, Micah, Habakkuk, and Zephaniah were all written pre-exile. Now there were a couple of books that were written during the exile. Obadiah, written against Edom, who was Esau's family. And Nahum, both of these were written during the exile. Prophets that were written post-exile, Joel, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. Now, where does Jonah fit into that? Jonah was written pre-exile, but he's a different sort of character because Jonah's the only prophetic book that doesn't really prophesy. And we're going to get to that book in a second, but I just want to put him as an outlier. But let's look at a couple other books in, in, in all of those. Uh, the first one we're going to look at is, at is Hosea. Uh, Hosea, Amos, and Jonah are really the three that I'm going to look at in detail here. And all three were written during Jeroboam II. Hosea and Amos are not mentioned in 2 Kings or 2 Chronicles, but uh, Jonah is. Uh, Jonah is me mentioned in uh, 2 Kings 14.25. And uh, we'll get to him in a second, like I said. But Hosea and Amos spoke harsh messages to Jeroboam. While Jonah spoke words that the king kind of wanted to hear. Hmm, interesting. Hosea, which means salvation of Israel. Interesting. Uh, prophesied to the northern kingdom for 25 years. He took a prostitute. Her name was Gomer, which means come to an end, as his wife and had two sons. Uh, his first son was named Jezreel which means God sows, and prophesying the invasion of Assyria into the north. Um, how would you like to be a kid called Jezreel, knowing that your name means that your country is going to be devastated? It's not really good parenting, I think, but it's what God called him to call his son. Like I mentioned uh, a couple weeks ago, these, uh, these prophets did some strange things and had some strange object lessons uh, in order to make their point. Uh, so Jezreel was Hosea's first son. Lo Rama, which means no compassion. Um, Yahweh is removing his compassion from the northern kingdom. Again, not the best of parenting, naming your kids that way, but you know that's what God called him to do in order to make a point to, to uh Israel, the northern kingdom, that their days were numbered. Hosea was to go after Gomer, 
the prostitute and restore her as his wife. Um, this is an image of God chasing after Israel who had prostituted herself to other gods and idols. Um, this is a sign of Yahweh pursuing Israel despite their sin, despite their, their uh, idolatry, and exposed Israel's hypocrisy. Hosea promises hope after destruction. So even though God is telling the northern kingdom, you're going to be exiled, you're going to be destroyed, he's, offering, he's also offering hope. He's offering the hope to the remnant of those who are following him that there is going to be a day when Israel, the full nation of Israel, will be restored. So that's uh, Hosea, the book of Amos. Amos is interesting. He was a farmer in Judah, and he was called to go to the north and prophesy to Jeroboam. The book is a collection of poems and sermons and visions, and he prophesied against Jeroboam and the northern kingdom about economic injustice, idolatry, um, all of this. He exposed Israel's hypocrisy, much like Hosea did. Uh, he prophesied that Assyria would invade and destroy Israel. He promised hope of restoration. So Amos, like Hosea, uses uh, lots of imagery and visions and poems and sermons in order to make the point that the days of the north are numbered, but there is hope at the end of it. Um, and that brings us to our friend Jonah. Now, what do we do with Jonah? A lot of people have abandoned the Bible or thought that the Bible was a collection of fairy tales because they read about some dude who went off in a boat, jumped off the boat, and lived in the whale or a big fish for three days and three nights. Well, let's look at Jonah. Because I think it's important to take Jonah in its context and who Jonah was. So we're going to be starting off with 2 Kings. And let's go to 2 Kings. And uh, chapter 14. And we are going to look at verse 25. So this is 2 Kings chapter 14, verse 25. He restored Israel's border from Loma, Lebo Hamath, as far as the Sea of Arabah, according to the word of the Lord, the God of Israel had spoken through his servant, the prophet Jonah, son of Amati, from Gath Hefer. Okay, throughout the minor prophets, all of the prophets prophesying to the north gave really tough messages to the king. And here we have Jonah speaking good messages to the king. Now, what does that mean? Jonah prophesied good things to a wicked king. Yes, it was from God. Absolutely. But when you compare it to the other prophets and what they were saying, he's ingratiating himself. It could be assumed that he's ingratiating himself to the king, as opposed to saying the hard things that the other prophets were saying. In the story of Jonah, and the story of Jonah is about Jonah, it isn't Jonah prophesying to the people. It's about Jonah. In the story, Jonah's the bad guy. He's the antagonist. All right? The protagonists, okay, so the good guys in this story are a few people. The pagan sailors. The sailors on the boat that were carrying Jonah away. They were the good guys. Uh, the pagan king of Nineveh, who repented and cause the people to repent. He's one of the good guys. And the pagan people of Nineveh. These are all the good people. These are the, all the protagonists in the story. All right? So when you're reading through Jonah, don't get bogged down in the details. Well, could a guy survive in a fish or not? Okay? If that disrupts you understanding what the book of Jonah is trying to say, think of it more as a political satire that 
the writer of the book of Jonah, which is more than certainly not Jonah, um, was doing what he was doing in order to make a satire of those prophets that were only prophesying good things to wicked kings. Jonah's used as a satirical figure and is used to point out how the prophets of Jeroboam, Jeroboam's hired prophets, were not willing to say the hard things to people in power. The story's point is, are you willing to do what it takes to see your enemy turn to God? Because Nineveh was the enemy of Israel. Nineveh was the Babylonian Empire. It was the place where just horrific things were happening. There were uh, pagans, much like nor the Northern Kingdom, um, but they were, they were political enemies. And Jonah ran away. He went in the opposite direction of where God called him because he didn't want to see his enemies come to faith. See, the whole thing of Jonah was Jonah knew that as soon as he preached redemption to the people of Nineveh, they would repent and be saved. He knew that. He knew it would happen. That's why he went the other direction. He didn't go because he was scared. He knew that God kept his promises and would do what he said he would do. So he went the other direction. And then God caused him to go back and do what he needed to do, preach redemption to the city of Nineveh. They all repented, and Jonah ends up a very angry, bitter man at the end of the story. The story's point again, what are you willing to do to see your enemies turn to God? It's a different way of thinking about it than we usually think about it. A couple more of the uh, minor prophets I want to talk about. Joel. Joel is a book that talks a lot about the day of the Lord, past events, future events. It's meant to bring salvation to the world. Uh, repentance and prayer are central to the revival Joel, Joel is pointing to. Now, I want you to notice the gospel elements here. So we're going to go to Joel, and we are going to go to, let's see if I can find him again. And we're going to go to Joel uh, chapter 2. And we're going to read verses 18 through 27. All right. So starting at verse 18. Then the Lord became jealous for his land and spared his people. The Lord answered his people, Look, I'm about to send you grain, new wine, fresh oil. You will be satiated with them. I will no longer make you a disgrace among the nations. I will drive the northerner, hmm, that is Babylon, that is Assyria. I will drive the northerner from you and banish him to a dry, desolate land. Now imagine being uh, uh, Israelite during Jesus' time, the northerner being Rome. And banish him from dry and desolate land, his front ranks into the Dead Sea and his rear guard into the Mediterranean Sea. His stench will rise, yes, his rotten smell will rise, for he has done astonishing things. Don't be afraid, land. Rejoice and be glad, for the Lord has done astonishing things. Don't be afraid, wild animals, for the wilderness pastures have turned to green, and the trees bear their fruit, and the fig tree and the grapevine yield their riches. Children of Zion, rejoice and be glad in the Lord your God because he gives you the autumn rain for your vindication. He sends showers to you, both autumn, spring, rain, and before. The threshing floors will be full of grain and the vats will overflow in new wine and fresh oil. I will repay you for the years that the swarming locust ate and the young locust and the destroying locust and my devouring locust and my great army I sent against you. Okay, all the locusts are representing the nations that have invaded Israel. And all of this uh, vision of abundance is abundance in the Lord. 
Um, it's very beautiful poetry talking about how God will save Israel, that God will save humanity using Israel. You have verse 26, you have plenty to eat and be satisfied. You will praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you. My people will never again be put to shame. You know that I am present in Israel and that I am the Lord your God and there is no other. My people will never again be put to shame. Beautiful, beautiful poetry there. Um, notice the gospel elements in there. Israel, Israel invaders are defeated. Sin and death is defeated at the cross. Restoration of the land, the restoration of Jesus and the believer's transformation into a new life. You know, Joel is talking about a new life for Israel, but it's reflecting on that gospel message of transformation through, uh, through Jesus. And then God's divine presence, sending the Holy Spirit into each believer. Let's read 28 through 32 of chapter 2. After this, and this should sound familiar if you've ever read the book of Acts and Peter's sermon in Acts chapter 2. After this, I will pour out my spirit on all humanity. Then your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will have dreams. Your young men will see visions. I will even pour out my spirit. On the male and female slaves of those days, I will display wonders in the heavens and the earth, blood, fire, and columns of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness, the moon to blood, before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Who? Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For there will be an escape for those on Mount Zion in Jerusalem, as the Lord promised among the survivors, the Lord calls. It's powerful. It's a powerful message of the gospel that the Holy Spirit, that spirit that used to dwell in buildings and uh, in sort of on people every now and then, is now in people, dwelling in people, and that's through Jesus. And that's why Peter used this passage for his message in Acts chapter 2. Let's finish up real quick uh, with Malachi. Malachi, the last of the minor prophets, the last book in our Old Testament, in the Hebrew scriptures. Um, Malachi uh, is an interesting book because you got to remember how Nehemiah ended. So the book of Nehemiah sort of ended on a down note with he shrugging his shoulders saying, oh, well, I tried. I tried to get them to follow you, Lord, and they just wouldn't do it. Israel, during the time of Malachi, and this is the time after they have returned from exile, returned to sinful ways of corruption and injustice. And Malachi is going to call them out. The book has a pattern. Okay, Malachi's prophecy has a pattern, like just about every single book we've read so far. Patterns everywhere. The book has a pattern. God accuses Israel, Israel disagrees, and God proves his accusation. All right, so the ac there, there are uh, six accusations Israel has neglected God's love, Israel has neglected God's temple. Uh, number three, Israel has neglected the institution of marriage through idolatry and divorce. Uh, Israel has neglected God's justice. Number five, Israel has neglected repentance. And number six, most important, Israel has neglected serving Yahweh. Malachi talks about the day of the Lord. And remember, Joel is the already and the not yet. So the return of the people from from uh, exile has happened, but the fullness of what Joel prophesied hasn't happened. So the day of, day of the Lord is coming. So we're going to look at Malachi, and uh, we're going to be looking at chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. All right. And this is how the Hebrew scriptures end. All right. Take that in. This is how the Hebrew scriptures end. For look, the day is coming, like burning like a furnace, when all the arrogant and everyone who commits wickedness will become stubble. 
The becoming day will consume them, says the Lord of armies, not leaving them to root or branches. But for you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in its wings, and you will go out and you will play, playfully jump like calves in the stall. You will trample the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day I am preparing, says the Lord of armies. Wow. So the future remnant of faithful people will enjoy God's favor and see God's justice. Let's finish up with verses 4 through 6. Remember the instruction of Moses, my servant, the statutes and ordinance I commanded him at Horeb for all of Israel. Look, I am going to send you the prophet Elijah. Elijah's already come. So who do you think he's talking about? Maybe John the Baptist? Look, I'm going to send you the prophet Elijah before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers and the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. Otherwise, I will come and strike the land with a curse. Ooh, that last verse is kind of a downer. But let's look at what he's saying here. He's unifying the Torah and the prophets into one complete story. Remember the instruction of Moses, my servant. Look, I'm going to send you the prophet Elijah. He's unifying the Torah and the prophets. And God will send a new Moses and a new prophet to bring the people back into fellowship with him. John the Baptist, he's a part of that. Jesus. Jesus is the major part of that. So we have finished the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament. And so next week we're going to have a brief word about the time period when Malachi was finished and the New Testament period begins. So until then, if you are enjoying this, please like and subscribe and uh, tell others about it. Share this video, comment in the section below if you need to. Uh, I'd love to have an email from you at wanderingwestland at hotmail.com. But until next week, God bless.